Welcome back to Beyond the Patterns. So today I have the great pleasure to announce Professor Dr. Jochen Hofmann. So he is a professor in law and business at the University of Erlangen-Nürnberg, so our university. And prior to that, he studied law and business at the University of Bayreuth, where he passed the first state examination in law in 1995 and received his doctorate in 1998. After passing the second state examination in law in 1998, he worked as a research assistant at the University of Bayreuth from 99 to 2006. He received his habilitation there in 2005. From 2006 to 2009, he was professor for civil law, business law and international economic law at the University of Hamburg. Since October 1st, 2009, Professor Hoffmann holds the chair for business law at the Friedrich Alexander University along Nuremberg and has been dean of the Faculty of Business, Economics and Law and the speaker of the School of Law since 2020. So it's a great pleasure to have him here as guest. You will see that we also have topics from the different fields of science and in particular today we want to look a bit into international competition law and in particular the European competition law because this is also something where computer science, machine learning and also forensics is very relevant in order to discover the relations between the different market players and also to unveil potential miscommunication or hidden communication that is actually not allowed. So this is exactly the topic that we will be hearing about today and the presentation is entitled Information Exchange as an Infringement of Competition Law. So I'm very much looking forward to this presentation and Jochen, the stage is yours. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you for the invitation and hello, everybody. Um, I, I hope that you uh, can hear me well. I just encountered some uh, technical problems here, understanding Andreas. So if, uh, if you can hear me, then uh, maybe you can just interfere. <laughs> um, I want to talk about information exchanges and infringement of competition law, as Andreas has already said today. Um, um, obviously, the, that is a, a topic that is, that is interesting um, because the exchange of information happens all the time, more or less. But we, as you can, as I will uh, demonstrate in a second, um, you have to be careful when exchanging information um, with people that, that especially that are uh, your competitors. Before I want to go into that, um, into that uh, specific topic, I want to give you a very brief overview uh, of European competition law, or what that is. Very brief, only in a nutshell. Um, we have a number of rules on the European level um, against private infringement of competition to protect the system of undistorted competition on the EU internal market. So we have an internal market in the European Union and it's the basis of that, of that market is the free movement of goods and the free movement of services and capital and people. And, um, all, and on this market that is um, enabled by the free movement principles, we um, have uh, the, we, we took the basic decision that it's a free market economy, and in the free market economy, is the basis of a free market economy is a, a system of undistorted competition, a working competition. You can also say so. We have to protect that from private parties acting um, against the um, the mechanism of competition, and that's what these rules are for. We have three basic elements of the uh, in European competition law that are 
widely known probably to most of you. You probably just don't know what the uh, underlying provision is. The first provision that we are going to focus on here today is Article 101 of the Treaty of the Functioning of the European Union. That is the acronym here, TFEU. Um, this is a basic um, contract underlying the um, European Union. And it contains rules to prohibit the collusion between market participants. Um, Article 102 that I'm not going to go further into here today um, is dealing with the prohibition of the abuse of a dominant position on the internal market. The most relevant cases of the of the last in the last couple of years were the Google cases, where Google was fined uh, altogether roughly 10 billion euros. Uh, based on the abuse of a dominant position on the internal market. The third element is the merger regulation, where that is not dealing with past infringements and the finding of uh, past infringements, uh, but rather the, uh, it's a procedure to enable the commission to prohibit mergers that would lead to a substantial impediment of effective competition, especially when it, uh, a merger that leads to a market dominating position uh, of the merged entity will be deemed to be um, illegal and therefore prohibited by the European Commission. Most relevant case or the most famous case of the past couple of years, especially in Erlangen, was the Siemens Alstom case um, where Siemens tried to merge the, the, the railway um, industry activities with Alstom and that was uh, this uh, merger was prohibited, prohibited by the European Union. I'm not going to go into that area either, just to give you an overview and an impression what the content of, the, uh, of European competition law is. But we want to focus today on Article 101 of the treaty, the rules against collision, because we, as we will see in a second, the collision uh, the um, exchange of uh, information is deemed to be a collusion, and therefore we are want to focus on this paragraph here. Um, this is the text of Article 101, Paragraph 1 of the treaty, abbreviated. The following shall be prohibited as incompatible with the internal market. All agreements between undertakings, decisions by associations of undertakings, and concerted practices which may affect trade between member states and which have as their object or effect the prevention, restriction, or distortion of competition within the internal market. And in particular, those which, and this is the abbreviation here, I only put down number A or litera A, directly or indirectly fix purchase or selling prices or any other trading conditions. So price fixing agreements, this is what is the most famous case under Article 101, um, uh, price fixing agreements like the catalyzation of the truck, uh, truck market in Europe in the 10, 10 year, in the 2010 years, uh, was a, a large case, a famous case that was decided by the European Commission under, uh, under this provision here. But this prohibition is very far reaching. It covers a lot of activities, a lot of forms of collusion and of cooperation between, uh, between not only between competitors, but also it applies to vertical agreements, cooperation between vendors, sellers, resellers, and manufacturers um, or wholesale, uh, wholesalers, for example, are also covered to the extent that these agreements contern, contain restrictions um, of competition. So we have to, we, we see there have to be a number of elements present in order to come to the conclusion that there is an infringement of Article 101. We have we are going to concentrate. Uh, today here on the concerted practices. We have to show that there is a concerted practice. I'm going to explain in just a second what that uh, means precisely. And we have to see whether that is uh, has as, a, as an object or effect the restriction of competition. The restriction of competition is a term that means the that you have to be, you, in general, you have to be free to set your, uh, take your own economic decisions on a, as a market participant. And if you are uh, coordinating this market behavior in any way uh, that is relevant to competition, then we are 
uh, speaking of the restriction of competition. And there's a differentiation between the object or the effect of the concerted practice um, uh, as an, a restriction of competition. Object um, means that you don't have to show anything else, just the, uh, the um, concerted practice. Because um, if, you, if you can say that the object of the concerted practice is, uh, of the concerted practice is the restriction of competition, um, it means automatically um, that there is no other reason for, uh, no other good reason, so to say, uh, to, to enter into such an agreement or such a concerted practice. Um, and therefore, it's an activity that is directed against, comp directly directed against competition to infringe competition. And that is something that is uh, per se, so to say, prohibited. If we don't have such a clear case, so the clear cases like uh, fix, price fixing are cases that are deemed to be restrictions by object. Um, if you do not have such a, a clear case, we have to look at the effect, at the economic effect. And if you, if you can see that uh, even if there are other foreseeable reasons to enter into such an agreement or uh, such a concerted practice, um, you still have to look at the, um, at the economic effects. And if you see, if you can find that the um, effect, the economic effect of the collusion is still a restriction of com competition to, um, um, to some extent, to some, with, with some relevance, then we, we can say it's a restriction by object and uh, by, uh, by effect. And therefore, it can still fall within the scope of this uh, of this provision of the of the prohibition here. As I already said, it's not only um, applicable to the relationship or collusion between competitors, which is which is of course the most uh, relevant case in, in price fixing cases, especially, but it's also uh, applicable to uh, vertical agreements. Um, the relationship between uh, manufacturers and vendors, for example. Um, sometimes manufacturers, especially when, when they are brand name manufacturers, have an interest in fixing the price on the retail market. So uh, we call that re uh, re uh, retail price maintenance. Um, and that is also an activity that is prohibited because it excludes any price um, uh, price competition um, on the retail market it has the same economic effect as a uh, price fixing agreement between the vendors themselves. So uh, this is just uh, an overview and we are going to take a look at the elements that are relevant for the information exchange in just a second. Before we do that, just a very quick view at Article 101, Paragraph 3 of the treaty. Uh, there is no prohibition of, uh, of collusion or of cooperation. You can also say without exemptions, and there is a, a very wide um, exemption rule in Article 101, Paragraph 3. I don't want to read it here. I just want to give you the general idea behind it. Cooperation makes economic sense in many ways. And therefore, this is a rule that is designed to differentiate between um, co co forms of cooperation that are directed against competition and are there to bring harm to consumers or the other side of the market more general, um, and agreements that make economic sense and that also give advantage, bring advantages for the, for the counter side of the market, especially to the consumers, which you can see here, um, which while allowing consumers a fair share of the resulting benefit. That is an element that we can, that we can see here. So you see, um, if it makes economic sense, the form of cooperation makes economic sense and there are efficiency gains that are also forwarded in some way to the counter side of the market, then uh, everybody in the market is going to be better off and therefore there is no reason to prohibit such, a, such an agreement. But I don't want to get uh, further into this because in the area of information exchange, it is not very relevant just to give you an idea of uh, what this, uh, the rule against collusion looks like. 
Um, we want to focus now on the concerted and uh, the issue of concerted practices uh, because information exchange is usually a concerted practice and not based on an, uh, based on an agreement. We have a very famous case in European competition law, the uh, Sulka Uni, Sugar Union uh, case, um, a Dutch case from 1975, if I remember it correctly, from the early days, so to say, of the uh, of uh, European competition law. And that, that is, was a groundbreaking case here for the appraisal um, of concerted practices. And the European Court of Justice here defined what constitutes a concerted practice. Um, a concerted practice refers to a form of coordination between undertakings which, without having been taken to the stage where an agreement properly so-called has been concluded, knowingly substitutes for the risks of competition practical cooperation between them. The criteria of coordination and cooperation must be understood in the light of the concept inherent in the provisions of the treaty relating to competition, that each economic operator must determine independently the policy which he intends to adopt on the common market. So whenever we are um, having some kind of cooperation, even if we have not taken it to a to an agreement, if we don't go far enough to say it's an agreement, we really agreed on something. Um, but if we can find that there, that the whole activity, this whole cooperation, um, led to a situation where the risk of competition between of competition between them was eliminated. Um, so you the insecurity about the further development on the market was eliminated between the, the competitors. Um, uh, that is, would be a deviation from the principle that every um, um, economic entity has to determine independently the course of action on the market, the policy that it wants to follow on the market. And therefore, we are deeming this a concerted practice. So concerted practice doesn't mean you have to agree on a certain practice. It just means that you came into some kind of, and this is the next slide, contact with, the, uh, with your competitors to enter um, some kind of, um, of uh, to have some kind of um, mechanism to enable uh, you to exclude the risks of competition between you. And it doesn't have to cover the whole market. Such an agreement would also be, or such a concerted practice would also be illegal if only two market participants would enter into it. So um, this is the second quote from the from this sugar union case. Although it is correct to say that this requirement of independence does not deprive economic operators of the right to adapt themselves intelligently to the existing and anticipated conduct of their competitors, it does, however, strictly preclude any direct or indirect contact between such operators. The object or effect whereof is either to influence the conduct on the market of an actual or potential competitor or to disclose to such a competitor the course of conduct which they themselves have decided to adopt or contemplate adopting on the market. And you see that this case that was not really dealing with information exchange, was a very different uh, setting of, uh, of facts here, uh, has a very clear idea of how, even in 1975, of how information exchange um, has to that, that information exchange also falls within the scope of the prohibition because disclosing the course of conduct on the market means in, in exchanging or forwarding information on future market conduct. So, what we uh, what we have to decide in every case is whether we have uh, we are dealing independently and just adapting ourselves intelligently to the existing and um, publicly known conduct on the market by the other market participants that is legal or if it uh, if you have come into contact and if you can show that there was a contact specifically 
by the means of information uh, disclosure or information exchange, we can say that this could is sufficient uh, to uh, for uh, for a concerted practice. So, if you want to uh, adapt intelligently to the existing to the conduct of other market participants, you have to make sure that you are only using public uh, publicly known information. I'm going to uh, come back to that point a little later, um, and not get into any kind of contact, any form of coordination uh, co or co uh, communication, I wanted to say, any form of communication between, even on the lightest, uh, lightest stage um, between, uh, with your competitor. So that's always the tricky point here is was there sufficient contact and has to be proved, of course, by the European Commission uh, if they want to find, uh, to find somebody um, that is also the tricky point. Was that really unilateral conduct just based on looking at the public information available or was there an underlying conduct uh, contact to exchange information? So what are the two elements that we have to, to look at when dealing with information, with the legality of information exchange? We have to first show that there was a concerted practice and concerted practice is only present um, if we have a contact, if you can show that, there's a, that there was a contact, some kind of contact between the competitors. And we have to see at the second level uh, whether we have a restriction by, uh, of competition by object or by effect. And as we will, I will elabor elaborate uh, later, um, that uh, depends on the nature of the exchanged information. So if you're just exchanging information uh, without um, um, any uh, commercial value, so to say, that is, of course, not a restriction of competition. Uh, so if you're exchanging information with your competitor, uh, where you're, what is a good school in, to send your children to, for example, that would be uh, totally legal, as you can probably envision. So we have to take a look at the nature of the, um, of the exchange information a little later. So why is it uh, so critical um, why, why is the information exchange so critical? Because we, it's quite obvious that information exchange can lead to a harmonized market behavior. Um, because by enabling, uh, by forwarding information, you make, uh, you, you, can, you enable your competitor to see what the, uh, what, what your strategy is. You open your, uh, your strategy either by, uh, by informing him of your past behavior that shows some kind of pattern and he can see, okay, this is a strategy based on the pattern of your, of your past behavior. And even more, uh, even more interesting, if you are uh, forwarding information on your future conduct, how you are planning to behave in the future, it's quite obvious that he has every incentive to uh, to take on a strategy that is um, um, uh, coherent with your strategy in order to raise the market price if you have a sufficient market uh, position uh, here. The second point, so it leads to harmonized behavior. Ex uh, information exchange can lead to a harmonized behavior on the market, which is prohibited, which is a classical form of restriction of competition especially when we are uh, talking about future behavior. And the second point is um, that sometimes we already have an illegal caudal, uh, caudalization, meaning a, like a price fixing agreement. And um, in, on a market where that is not very transparent, uh, especially when you are dealing with uh, a small, uh, with, with large market participants and industrial settings, for example. You're, so you're not selling uh, single pairs of shoes to somebody, but you are rather selling a hundred thousand pairs of shoes to a wholesaler or something like that, or industri industrial, like a machine, like machinery or some other, some other sort of. Uh, 
um, large scale contract uh, contracts or large scale uh, machinery that is used in, the, in industry settings. There is no no transparent price here. So you, there is no way where you can just look at what the price is and, and uh, what price was asked by a specific from a specific um, person when in, uh, when you're selling such a such a good. Um, and therefore, um, it is hard if you have a uh, um, if you have a, a illegal card, a price fixing agreement. It's hard to monitor whether everybody is on the market. Everybody was part of that uh, illegal cartel is actually adhering to the prices, or if he is deviating uh, to make an extra profit from that and uh, offering a lower price. So that would be a very rational strategy. So. In, uh, in price cartels, they're always trying to monitor the price development and uh, the adherence to their to the agreement. Um, and information exchange of on the charge prices in the past uh, will be uh, will enable the participants in the in the cartel to stabilize it because you can punish, you can monitor whether people are actually asking the right price and you can punish them by lowering the price yourself when you find that there is deviation on the market and, and you can do that directly against a uh, specific um, intruder so to say uh, because you can uh, specifically target his customers so that can be information exchange therefore can be a kind of um, mechanism that is dealing with that is um, uh, used to stabilize an otherwise already existing illegal cartel, and therefore um, um, uh, should be uh, should also be prohibited um, in, in because it's sometimes hard to demonstrate that there actually was that underlying. Um, price fixing agreement that was actually in place, but it's but it's possible to show that they exchange information, so that makes sense then under this uh, in this uh, in this situation to punish both of them because if you it's sufficient to show that one of the two elements one of the two uh, um, illegal behaviors was present in order to be able to punish that editors colluded over their future conduct on the market. So you don't, if you have exchange information to be able to later get into an agreement, a price fixing agreement, for, for example, and then you come to the, to the conclusion, no, I don't really want to get into the price fixing here. We are not going to enter into a price fixing agreement. It is even sufficient that you have in exchange information for the preparation of that uh, other agreement. Um, and you don't even have to show that the information was used to take to adopt a particular course of conduct. So that I had really uh, that the uh, exchange information really led to a conclusion. Uh, to, you know, to, the, to a collusion in the sense that they took, this, took up the same strategy. Just the potential to use the information is sufficient uh, to, uh, for an infringement of Article 101 of the treaty. So that was a case where they prepared, exchanged information, and didn't do anything afterwards, and, but behaved, tried to get back into legality, but it was too late. They had already infringed Article 1 and 1 of the treaty. So you see, this is a very strict point of view. And the strict point of view was also uh, again taken up by the European Court of Justice in the Dole case, Dole Bananas, as you probably are a well known company on the banana market. While it is correct to say that this requirement of independence does not deprive economic operators of the right to adapt themselves intelligently to the existing or anticipated conduct of their competitors, it does nonetheless strictly preclude any direct or indirect conduct 
contact between such operators by which an undertaking may influence the conduct on the market of its actual or potential competitors or disclose to them its decisions or intentions con concerning its own conduct on the market where the object or effect of such contact is to create conditions of competition which do not correspond to the normal conditions of the market in questions. Now, why did I, it already sounded familiar to you, the first part of this quote. The European Court of Justice always has very long sentences, as you can see here. So if you want to quote a sentence, it usually takes a whole slide, uh, as you can see here in this example. Now, the first part is already is just what the European Court of Justice has already said in Sugar Union. You already saw that at the beginning of the presentation. So now what is new here? Um, the object or effect of such contact is to create conditions of competition which do not correspond then to the co normal conditions of the market in question. So what the European Court of Justice said is sufficient. You don't have to... Uh, a sufficient restriction of competition just to change the conditions of competition on the market. So even if you are not raising the prices or something that they are lowering the quantities, um, it's sufficient to show that there was a, a change of uh, con uh, in the conditions of competition on the markets by uh, having this higher transparency based on the uh, on the exchange of information. And therefore, this was another step to make, uh, to adopt very strict, a uh, very strict reading of Article 101 of the treaty, that it's sufficient that uh, only the conditions of competition have to be somehow changed. Um, changed from the normal conditions in, uh, of the market in question. Okay, um, and that is already present, this change, this uh, creation of artificial market conditions is already present if we uh, exchange information. And that is already, especially when we are looking at the future, is a restriction by object. I already told you, it's, uh, we have to differentiate between the restriction of object and by effect. Uh, sufficient if we exchange information on our future behavior. Why? Because it remove, reduces or removes the degree of uncertainty as to the operation of the, oper oper operation of the market in question with the result that competition between undertakings is restricted. In particular, an exchange of information which is capable of removing uncertainty between participants as regards the timing, extent, and details of the modifications to be adopted by the undertakings concerned in their conduct on the market must be regarded as pursuing an anti-competitive object, even if there is no direct contact, uh, uh, connection uh, to consumer prices. So just by... Uh, making, making uh, by exchanging information on when we are going to change our behavior. For example, pricing behavior. We are going to say, we are going to change this and that. Quantities of import, for example, uh, even if there is no direct connection to consumer prices, just by saying, we are going to change our prices December 1st, not exchange information on what the price change is going to look like, just by, uh, may, by uh, communicating in, in advance at what time, uh, what, uh, what day that is going to take place can be sufficient because the other, there's, uh, it reduces the degree of uncertainty as to the functioning of this market. So the others are warned then that there is going to be a change uh, and they can uh, make their own preparation to change their prices on the same day, um, even if they don't know in which direction the price change is going to uh, take place. And of course, the more detailed the information is, especially pricing information is that is sh shared, the more problematic it's going to be. But it's sufficient to really show that there is a, uh, only a small uh, or less relevant um, information uh, is exchanged. <clears throat> uh, 
So that leads us to the, the second element. So we have to we see that concerted practice is uh, um, if we have some kind of contact underlying the information exchange and the information exchange is the contact. So you are communicating the information that is sufficient as a, uh, as a contact, even if the recipient of the information doesn't even react to it. And if he doesn't say anything, just um, memorizes the information and says, thank you very much, that is going to be sufficient to be a form of contact. Um, if you, and that means that both sides of the information exchange, uh, information exchange can also be one way, um, uh, will be fine. They are both uh, infringing Article 1 and 1 of the treaty, and therefore the European Court of Justice in, in different settings and other cases said that if you are, uh, if somebody gets in contact with you and uh, forwards information that you don't want, you have to make it clear right away, you have to distance yourself clearly from any infringement of Article 101 right away, directly, at the same, uh, in, this, in, this, in the same meeting usually. You have to get up and say, I don't want to have this information there. Uh, I don't want any part of this collusion and therefore I'm out. That's what you actually have to do and the most, uh, um, the best way to, to, make, to make it obvious is to contact the European Commission and tell them what was said that day. So um, very strict rules in place here and um, what we, uh, uh, what that leads us to is that we have many situations where we can say we have an inform information exchange and therefore we are already have a concerted practice. And the second level is that we have to decide whether that is a restriction of competition, restrict, is it a restriction by object, is it directed against competition directly, so most clear cases, or is it only a restriction by effect? The consequence in both cases is the same, it's an infringement of Article 1 and 1, but the burden of proof is much different. If you have a restriction of object, you don't have to prove anything else when you're the, if you're the commission. If you have a restriction by effect, you have to, to, to demonstrate the economic effect that it has, and that can sometimes be hard. So you have to make an economic appraisal of the situation on the market and show that it really has an actual effect and only an, if you can show that, then uh, you will find um, um, that there is an infringement of Article 101. So that is um, a difference that is very relevant when you're really, when you're actually um, fining somebody, when you're actually um, entering into a um, procedure against a given, comp any, a given company. Um, so it's uh, important to differentiate between those two kinds of information. And of and uh, obviously there's, all, uh, there's also a group of uh, information that is not problematic at all. It's not a restriction, it's not even a restriction by effect uh, if it's not a significant, uh, uh, sufficiently relevant um, commercial information. So what is the relevant information? I already said we have to look at the nature of the information now to decide whether the, it's, uh, it's exchanged is a restriction of competition and whether it's a restriction by object or by effect. This point, um, so the nature of information was clarified by the European Commission in the guidelines on horizontal cooperation. The guidelines are not laws, but it's, it's rather the publication of the interpretation of the law uh, published by the European Commission. And they said, exchanging information on companies' individualized intentions concerning future conduct regarding prices or quantities is particularly likely to lead to collusive outcome. Informing each other about such intentions 
may allow competitors to arrive at a common higher price level without incurring the risk of losing market share or triggering a price war during the, during the period of adjustment to new prices. Information exchanges between competitors of individualized data regarding intended future prices or quant quantities should therefore be considered as a restriction of competition by object. So the so clearest cases are information about future prices or future quantities, how much, uh, uh, how many uh, shoes you want to, to sell on, on the market, or how many shoes you are producing or something like that. That it has the same economic effect as a price hike if you're reducing quantity. So um, that is uh, the clearest case, and that's uh, where we can say this is the, the most dangerous uh, way of informing uh, of information exchange because it enables the uh, competitors to take up the same uh, the same strategy, uh, um, use the same prices in the future, and therefore is going to lead has the same economic effect as a price fixing agreement just by the advanced information about the uh, uh, future pricing decisions. So that is the restriction by object. Only those clear cases are restrictions by object. In other cases, we have to look at the effect of it, as I already said. And most information exchange cases are actually restriction by effect cases. Um, and that is much wider than the uh, restriction by object. Sharing of strategic data can give rise to restrictive effects on competition because it reduces a party's decision-making independence by decreasing their incentives to compete. Strategic information can be related to prices, for example, actual prices, discounts, increases, reductions, or rebates, customer lists, production costs, quantities, turnovers, turnovers. So only if we have some relevance on the market, the information exchange and taking up a common strategy will be a risk for competition. If you have very small competitors on a very large market, then there is no risk for competition, uh, for the competition on the market because they have no effectively, cannot effectively uh, change the market conditions by themselves. So, but what you can see here in this quote is that this is a very far reaching principle. So you have to make this appraisal for a lot of uh, information. And this is not only meant about future behavior, but this can also uh, be applied uh, for past behavior. Because if you look at past prices and past price changing uh, patterns on uh, uh, something like that, then you can, uh, you, can, uh, you can see the pattern and therefore see the strategy uh, uh, that, it, and you may, um, infer from that what the strategy for, this, for the future may also be. Especially when you look at capacities, what is the capacity? Am I working at, at full capacity? Meaning that I cannot um, produce more, a, qu a higher quantity if we are, um, if uh, prices are rising, um, then that um, says a lot about me, if, uh, uh, about my strategy, if I work at full capacity um, um, compared to uh, the situation when the competitors know that they are working at less than full capacity and always have the uh, opportunity to uh, raise output. So you see, um, strategic data, it has to be some kind of strategic data with some relevance for the commercial practice, for commercial strategy. But uh, if, if it falls outside of the scope of this strategic data, then it is irrelevant. But as soon as we have, it has some kind of, com uh, of uh, um, uh, as it has some kind of um, uh, relevant for strategic decisions, the information uh, that is shared, then we have to make a case-by-case -case appraisal whether there are sufficient economic effects on, on the competition um, 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 present. So and when making that appraisal on the case-by-case -case basis, you have to should take a look at case-by-case -case basis on the uh, precise information that was exchanged, what 
how can this information be used? Is that really relevant for the competition for competition on the market? And the second question: What is the market position of the exchange uh, exchanging companies? Only if they are relevant for the market, then only then we can deem it to be a um, restriction of competition. Um, so the uh, the difference uh, usually is between, if you're looking at exchanging um, such strategic data, uh, is as a difference between aggregated data and individualized data. If we have individualized data, we know exactly which company did what. That is much more problematic than aggregated data where we only are looking at the whole development of the market. So aggregating data where you can see how market participants overall uh, behaved in the, few, in, in the past is uh, usually legal, uh, not a restriction of competition. And uh, only if you can individual, if, if the information is individualized, so you can see from the data which company asked which price, for example, or which company produced which quantity in the past, for example, that would be, um, that would be much more problematic when you're making this appraisal concerning the economic effect of it. And the third point, historic data, the exchange of historic data that is far in the, in the past, uh, not very recent, but rather from last year or something like that, where you can, where you can say, okay, this is far away enough to, to, uh, that, that you cannot infer anything for my present strategy, that exchange is also usually deemed to be uh, not problematic. Um, I want to take a quick look also at two specific situations. The first situation is a hub and, hub and spoke situation. So we have, sometimes we have a situation that we have um, um, a, a company or some kind of undertaking that has relationship with uh, to different competitors and this and acts as a hub between the uh, competitors and how uh, competitors here are the spokes. So hub here in the wheel is the hub and the spokes are the competitors. So if we have uh, such a situation that is, uh, has the same effect as a direct exchange of information, everybody gives its, its information, all the spokes gives the information to the hub and the hub forwards the information to all the spokes. That is the same as if the spokes were communicating directly, usually you're using such a hub in order to, to make it harder for the competition authorities to show the contact. Um, but if there is a, uh, if you are using the hub um, as a contact person, so to say, then that is also going to be sufficient um, and uh, for, uh, for an infringement of article 101. So examples for such hubs are manufacturers or wholesalers for the next market level, uh, like for retail, uh, for, for retailers. Uh, we have platforms, electronic platforms um, um, are possible and uh, specific market information systems. Those are companies that are specializing in market information. So they have to be very careful to only to publish or to forward uh, aggregated data. They are there to use, to, to uh, collect the aggregated data. If they are forwarding individualized data, there would be such a hub and spoke situation also. The participation of the third party doesn't affect the legality of the concerted practice based on the use of the information. So that using such a hub for the exchange of information also uh, constitutes, even if there is no direct contact, also constitutes a concerted practice and is therefore going to be, uh, is held to be illegal. The hub operator is also part of the legal collusion he enables the spokes to collude with one another. And even if he is not active on the market that is affected, he is also going to be uh, held liable. That was decided a couple of years ago in the famous AC Toyhand case. There was a service provider and that it served as an information hub for, uh, for a price fixing agreement, you can say. 
Um, and they said, hell, we didn't have anything to do with the market. We were just forwarding information. We were just enabling them uh, to, to make the price fixing, but we didn't have anything directly to do with the price fixing. With the, price fixing. the European Commission was not amused, the European Court of Justice neither. As I said, aim of Article 101 is to ensure that competition remains undistorted within the common market. The interpretation of the provision advocated by AC Treuhand would be liable to negate the full effectiveness of the prohibition laid down by the provision in so far as such an interpretation would mean that it would not be possible to put a stop to the active contribution of an undertaking to restriction of competition, simply because that contribution does not relate to an economic activity forming part of the relevant market on which that restriction comes about or is intended to come about. That is not even the whole sentence. I, as I already told you, the sentences by the European Court of Justice are always a nightmare, nightmarish lot. But what they say is, um, even if you're only a contributor to a price fixing agreement or some kind of other uh, restrictive agreement by other parties, you will also be held liable and you will also be fined by, uh, fined by the commission. We still have the situation where we have a parallel behavior without any contact. And if we do not find any contact, then that is not a concerted practice. And we have to show that there is a concerted practice in order to apply Article 101. So what we already saw that quote by the European Court of Justice, the undertakings have the right to adapt themselves intelligently to the conduct of the, compet of the competitors as long as there is no contact. So that's what we call parallel market behavior. You can watch what everybody else is doing on the market and just do the same. You can copy their strategy. It's absolutely illegal to copy somebody else's strategy or to follow a price leader, especially the market leader. That is always something that specifically small competitors usually do. You don't want to engage into a, a price war or something like that with a large company. Therefore, you just follow their example. The result is the same. There is not that much competition left on the market, but still that is the legal form um, of applying the, the same strategy. But you have to make sure that you're uh, copying the, others, uh, the other company's strategy um, is uh, not done via contact or information exchange, but rather by the use of public communication. Um, if, you're only, if you're only using public communication, like advertisements or public price lists or something like that, and just um, a copy uh, the, the behavior that you see from public communication, then you are usually um, in a on a, on a safe uh, on the safe spot, and there is no incentives incentive even such a well functioning uh, oligopolistic market to e even try to engage in price fixing because the result is the same and it's legal. So. Uh, just because the price is the same doesn't mean that there was really an underlying price fixing agreement or some kind of illegal um, in, uh, advanced information exchange. As I said, this uh, behavior is legal, but there is one point that makes that uh, has the potential to make it illegal, and that is the uh, if, um, if, if it's part of an agreed strategy. So the European Com Commission says that it's possible, even if you don't have a real contact, you cannot really sh see a real contact, to communicate via open communication to fix a common strategy. Um, where a company makes a unilateral announcement that is also genuinely public, for example, through a newspaper, this generally does not constitute a concerted practice within the meaning of Article 101. However, 
The possibility of finding a concerted practice cannot be excluded, for example, in a situation where such an announcement was followed by public announcements by other competitors, not least because strategic responses of competitors to each other's public announcements, which, to take one instance, might involve readjustments of their own early announcements to announcements made by competitors, could prove to be a strategy for reaching a common understanding about the terms of coordination. So if you can, see, if you can show that there is really a strategy to fix the prices just by using open communication. For example, you are, uh, one company public, pub, uh, publicizes that they are going to uh, raise the prices by 10% January 1st. And they've public, uh, published that on uh, October 1st. So they are three months of time. Then the other competitors have the chance to react to that and say, okay, we are going to change the prices only by 5%. And then the first company might say, okay, uh, that means that I'm going to be in, in a worse uh, uh, competitive situation and therefore I'm going to make a new announcement um, before uh, January 1st that I'm not going to raise my prices by 10% but rather only by 5%. And that if you can see that there's this kind of strategy used then even public information exchange can be sufficient to be deemed to be a contact and therefore uh, uh, constitute uh, therefore constitute uh, a concerted practice. So what are the challenges that uh, this poses, um, or let me say the, the open questions rather, I call the challenges here on the slide, but it's rather the open question that, that uh, can be answered in the future. Um, um, Non-coordinated use of the same pricing software. If, if you are you, uh, looking at digital markets and the same pricing software that is reacting to other, uh, to, uh, to the uh, other market participants um, is used by different competitors. Is that sufficient to prove a common anti-competitive strategy? Even if there is no contact to speak about that, whether which uh, software to use unilaterally or, or something like that or common, uh, even if there was no contact, just by looking what is the other company doing, for example, I see they are using the pricing software by company X and just and then deciding, okay, if I use the same pricing software, then we are not going to, we can rely on not getting into a price war. Is that already sufficient proof of a common anti-competitive strategy and uh, a concerted practice? That would be one of the questions that would be interesting to answer. Can software producers be seen as an anti-competitive hub based on the publication of its customers? So if we have, have a software uh, software producer that is producing and selling pricing software and that uh, that, uh, com the company would publish the names of their customers, of the, of the companies using their pricing software, it would make it easier for the competitors to say, okay, if I use the same pricing software, um, I'm going to be able um, to coordinate why I'm using the same, the same software. Um, the prices with my competitors. So I'm going to look at the publication of uh, software manufacturer X and see, okay, my main competitor is a customer of them. So I'm going to buy the same software from them in order to reach that anti-competitive result. Is that sufficient to be uh, the basis of a concerted practice just by publishing who my uh, who my customers are because of the effect that the pricing software has on the pricing strategy in the future. That would be one of the questions that we can also address. What are the challenges of uh, AI as market participants? This is probably the most interesting, hardest questions. Will AI used by multiple sellers find a way to exchange information over the market without direct contact? Will it be possible for AI to uh, communicate different than humans and therefore find other ways 
to exchange information without getting an actual contact with, uh, with one another and still achieves the aim of raising the price to a super competitive level. And if the, last, the latter can be foreseen, is it already part of a common anti-competitive strategy to use artificial intelligence to act on markets? So can it be sufficient to say, I am using an AI agent as a pricing agent um, uh, just because you know that there are other market participants there and you know that the AI is going to uh, communicate or find ways to exchange information in some way. And those are the questions that I would be very interested in discussing with you. Thank you very much for your attention. Yeah, thank you very much for the presentation. It's really interesting, the competition laws and how to actually prevent large marketplace participants uh, in, to prevent essentially competition. And uh, I think they they like to do that, of course, because then they can make more money, right? So yeah. th there's this, this strategy of open source and then nobody makes money out of that. And they I recently had a discussion and the person I was talking to had the opinion that if you release something um, as open source, then you're essentially removing the entire competition because it can be used for free then by everybody. So is open source an anti-competitive strategy? From what, from your perspective, what would you say? I think I have to understand the question first. So using open source, um, what, what is the software doing? I think it depends on what the, what the software is actually do, doing. Let's say you have a software for video conferencing and you have, instead of making a product of, out of it, you release the software as open source. And then, uh, because then everybody can use the software for free, then the entire market is destroyed. So is, is open source software destroying the competition? Um... No, not really. We're doing that. <laughs> um, well, destroying or pro, um, preventing a market from existing is not the same as uh, restricting competition on the market. So we only have the competition if we have already if we already have a market. So um, destroying a market is is an issue. Um, if it's taken up by um, by some, uh, it can be deemed to be an abuse of a dominant position. If you are um, directly um, and artificially destroying a market that would otherwise have been um, have uh, have existed, um, to extend the monopoly that you have on a. Uh, on a different market. So that was the case that was very, um, was decided in the, uh, in the zero years. Um, um, in the case of a small company from, from Washington uh, called Microsoft, you might've heard of it. Uh, they are producing some kind of uh, computer software and they, they used to have a, a, a product called Windows you might have heard of it, I assume. Uh, you're probably not using it, I assume. But you, you know, programmers don't like Windows because they think too much fresh air is bad for them. <laughs> okay, <laughs> I get the point. Uh, so Windows, um, you know, in the early days, you might remember that, in the early days, there was a Netscape navigator to browse the internet. You might remember that. Um, and then on, um, in 2002, uh, something like that, uh, Windows decided, uh, or uh, Bill Gates decided, to include the Internet Explorer into the Windows package. And from one day to the next, the whole market didn't exist anymore. Because everybody had to buy the uh, Windows system in order to have an operating system. And so they had the uh, bundled product with it. Uh, a bundled uh, Internet Explorer with that. And therefore, uh, the, you, know, you can really say the uh, Microsoft destroyed the uh, independent market for, um, for computer browsers. And therefore, Netscape Navigator ceased to exist. I think they 
bought the uh, Microsoft bought Netscape later in order to prevent an owner of Netscape to bring an antitrust suit to the court system and ask them for damages like 10 billion euros or something like that. So that is an example uh, where you are abusing market power to get rid of a market uh, at all. That would be an abuse of a dominant position, but just but it's not a form of collusion to destroy a market. Mm -hmm. And if a, a programmer decides to, just for the good of humanity to release his software as open source, is he also somehow destroying the market or? Yes, but he's not a market dominator before that. Exactly. Because the point in the Microsoft case was that, that they extended the monopoly, the quasi monopoly at the time on the operating system market to the, um, to the browser market. That was the problem, the extension. Of, uh, of a monopoly. And if the programmer has no market power, but is just publishing his work for the good of, uh, for the advancement of the world, uh, then he has uh, he's no risk uh, from competition law. Mm -hmm. yeah, but no competition law, but an interesting, I found it interesting because for me as a computer scientist, it just seemed um, very natural, in particular that software is generated by the public hand, by researchers that are paid from public money, that they should also release the software as open source as much as possible, because it, it has been paid by the general public anyway. And <laughs> there should be a rule that would have to be applied by the by the um, uh, by the public hand as an employer. So, the, as an employer, it would be possible to. Uh, to regulate a, um, um, you can say to, to to regulate the use of the of the results of mm -hmm. uh, our work, and um, there there is a mechanism for uh, for revenue sharing. But if if no revenue is uh, uh, if no rev revenue is generated just by public uh, by the publication, then there is also no revenue sharing. So that would be a possible possible way. There might be some limits um, in, uh, in because of the uh, of the intellectual property, and uh, so there we would have to uh, under constitutional law you cannot just take somebody else's uh, intellectual profit, uh, property but it makes sense you could as an employer you could find a mechanism and uh, to uh, to impose such an obligation but it would have to it would have to be done in our context uh, as the, as uh, employees of the public hand um, it would have to be done by the lawmaker and the lawmaker obviously doesn't have any plans to do that yeah, I think also most developers um, like to do that anyway, in particular in research, because it's also a very good means of, you know, conveying your research. And mm -hmm. people like to use the, not just read the paper, but also like to use the open source software because then they can get ahead. And to be honest, many companies are also releasing prototype software as open source. Mm -hmm. And we have seen in particular in artificial intelligence and deep learning and so on. Uh, essentially all of the software is released open source because otherwise it cannot be guaranteed that the results can be reproduced. So mm -hmm. if somebody just publishes wonderful results and you don't have access to the data, then, you know, you also get doubts whether this actually works. And, <laughs> and how do you create revenue then? Well, for many of the companies, they like to share um, tools as open source software. So, for example, software development tools for writing code, they are then often shared between many companies and they all share their efforts towards contributing to those tools. And in the end, all of them benefit, but also the general public. So is that, is that a, a kind of collusion? I mean, everybody... Hard, hard to, to say. I think you have to get further into the, into the facts of, of, of the form of cooperation. So if it's just published and... and, and um... Yeah, so often they need tools for the development of the software, like um, for writing the code. And it's essentially mm -hmm. like you need a typewriter for writing text. You also need some tools for developing your code. 
Mm. And they often, instead of developing only in-house tools and only developing with those tools, they share it even with their competitors, but also with the general public that then can write software. And the idea is that then others also contribute to the improvement of these tools. And in the end, everybody has a better um, software coding tool. And this happened um, very, very regularly. Um, so is there any, are there any risks for the other side of the market? That is always a question that you have to, end, uh, 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 you have to ask. Is obviously, you have, you have to show that there is some anti-competitive effect coupled with that. And I currently don't see any anti-competitive effect, especially no effect for the consumer side of that, of that market. Because everybody is better off as a result of the, of the cooperation, right? And that is something that would also, even if you can come to the conclusion that, uh, that there is some kind of restriction by effect, um, that in Article 1 and 1, Paragraph 3, the exemption rule would also cover. I see. That's, that's good to know because um, open source plays a relevant role. And mm -hmm. sometimes um, they, pe some people in particular old-fashioned, um, maybe also the politician type, um, <laughs> uh, conservative people think that the open source software is harmful because otherwise money could be made from that particular tool. You know, you could also establish a market where somebody sells the development software. Yeah. And they completely get rid of, the, uh, of that and everybody's profiting from the synergy. Yeah. So if you have such a market and um, the cooperation via the open, so if, if you are cooperating via open source and still selling the product, um, selling that, that tool to, to a different market, to the other market side, then actually you could have an anti-competitive effect um, based on the cooperation. Um, because uh, but, you know, that's when the exemption rules, uh, rule might apply. Because um, this cooperation would probably mean, that, as I understand uh, the example, that everybody produced would, also pro uh, would only produce the same tool, right? So there is no innovation competition anymore that is eliminated because the only tool that would be available would be the tool that everybody has worked on together. There are uh, rules for this kind of cooperation. This would be a, a research and development cooperation, uh, a group exemption regulation rules, so <laughs> more uh, precise set of, uh, set of norms um, in the application of Article 101 paragraph or three, um, so, uh, but there might be, if you see that for these tools that they are practically developing together, that they are afterwards are actually sold to, sold to, uh, to, to consumers, um, then um, the, it would at least, the corporation would at least fall under the scrutiny of uh, competition law, which does not mean that it would be illegal. Mm, interesting. It depend on whether everybody would profit. From it. Yeah, there's also some some open source uh, based uh, business models, but there the business model is not selling the software, but the service to install the software and uh, service mm. the machines that the software runs on. So everybody can download the software and use it, but it's actually pretty tricky to set up mm. and to maintain. <laughs> okay. And in this case, so you actually sell the service of installing and running the operating the software. So I think SUSE Linux and so on, they, they then, you know, retrofit it to a particular mm -hmm. company or company network. And so you have to apply changes to make it fit for that mm -hmm. particular um, customer. Mm -hmm. And this is the actual service that they sell. Well, but that would be a very different service from, from the production of the software itself. And so therefore, if you don't get into contact with, uh, with one another to fix prices or something like that, then that would be uh, improb uh, unproblematic. Mm. Yeah. yeah, but it's sometimes this comes up and uh, if you yeah, are into open source software, then it would also be interesting to know about the pitfalls that could potentially lie in competition now, because before that, I never thought about that, that mm. there might be the risk of manipulating markets with open yeah. source software. But it, it's good to have your opinion on that. There's, so there's these large players like Google, Facebook, and so on. 
and they often offer software for like zero euro such that a particular product is never developed is is that yeah is is that something that needs to be prevented or is that do you think google and facebook have to be broken down into smaller units um well <clears throat> i think that those are different questions um Well, in the, uh, let me address the two parts of the question. First, the first question is, um, um, is it problematic that uh, Google, for example, um, produces the software for the, for the, for the, uh, for the cell phones, what's that called? Uh, and Android, Android, and exactly. gives it away for free. Uh, they are not doing that because they are nice people. We know that. They are doing that in order to extend their uh, monopoly for the or quasi monopoly for uh, for the, for their main service uh, search machine, search engine, search engine um, to the uh, mobile market um, in order to to stop other competitors from from getting their search engines onto on the mobile market. They did that in very early in the development of the smartphone and therefore we were able more or less to monopolize the, um, the, the market, the search engine market um, also on the, on the smartphone market. So you always have to take a look at what, what is behind it. And uh, in that, um, and one of the Google cases actually was the Android case where some aspects of the use or the forwarding of Android was uh, challenged, but only very specific as aspects of the, of the model. The general um, provision of the software itself was not challenged by the European, uh, by the European Commission. You could probably see that in a different way also, because I, I do think that this is also a case that is more or less comparable to the Microsoft case, um, just with the difference that there was not a bundle, you, there was not a bundling, but it had the same economic effect of that. But it was all, would also not be a case um, under Article 101. It's not a case of collusion, but it's rather a, um, a case under abuse of market uh, dom of market domination. Um, and you could see it that way that as a a uh, free provision of a software and the, um, and the extension of an, uh, of an existing monopoly to a different neighboring market um, would also, uh, that you could see it that way, that, is, that this, is, uh, this is sufficient for abuse of a market dominating position. But as I already said, the European Commission did not take up this view, but they are were just challenging specific aspects of the functioning of the Android uh, software, not the general principle that they were providing the software for free. Um, the other uh, question was about breaking up a small, uh, large um, platforms into smaller parts. Um, the history of breaking up companies um, um, is not very fruitful. Let me put it, put it that way. It was there has not been a case where uh, when you look back 20 years later, where you were really saying this was a good idea. Um, the first case um, where this was done by, first of all, in European law, we have no breakup mechanism, neither in European nor in German law. So what the cases that exist are from American law, where they have had that for more than 100 years. The first case where it was applied was a standard oil case in 19 something 20 uh, or so, about 100 years ago. Um, and it didn't, uh, if I remember that correctly, the, um, the, the, the breakup uh, allowed standard oil to get rid of the smaller parts of some of the smaller parts of the company that were not really um, critical for the for the, the for the core business of Standard Oil, and therefore it makes it made them more or less even stronger. 
and it didn't really um, uh, didn't really interfere with uh, with their ability uh, to to act independently on that on that market. So this was parts that were taken away from Standard Oil of New Jersey, that was called then, um, where parts that were not powerful enough to really engage in, in real uh, competition. If I remember it correctly, it's, uh, I read about that case maybe 20 years ago, so don't really hold me liable for it. Um, the second well-documented case um, is a baby bell case. Um, the bell company was, uh, bell corporation was the, um, uh, had a, some kind of telecommunication monopoly in the U.S. in the 1960s and or was broken up into so-called so baby belts um, companies with regional, um, for, for regional, as regional carriers um, in the beginning of the 1970s, if I remember that correctly. Um, afterwards, they were allowed to merge again, like 30 years later, because um, the c conclusion was it didn't make any sense. Because we had, we broke up, uh, it was a network-based uh, company, of course, so they broke up a large network into smaller networks, but the small networks all had a regional monopoly. And how do you want to break up a network otherwise than by creating regional monopolies? So. The consumer of the regional market they still didn't have a different market, uh, different market participants. We still had to get his uh, telephone line from the baby bell in charge for his area. And um, <clears throat> they were in active competition on the long distance carrier market. But that was uh, also obviously uh, in the long run uh, uh, not very effective. So the, the, that in a competition law, most scholars believe that it doesn't make any sense. You might be able to do it in a better way, in a more clever way than it was done in the United States at the time. Um, but still, um, you, will have, you would have to take a, um, a look at the specific market and see whether under those specific circumstances it really makes sense and it really is going to create competition between the broken up company. So, and now we look at a company like Facebook. Um, if you break up Facebook, how do you want to break up Facebook? Okay, you can, you can break it, uh, break the small parts away from it, like WhatsApp uh, was merged before. That would be one way of, of, of being able to do that. But that would not, uh, would not affect the core business of Facebook. And you cannot break up Facebook. Because the customers, if you say, okay, 1 billion customers go to uh, Facebook A and the second billion customers go to Facebook B and so on, there's no way of preventing of them to go back. And if you say the European customers go to Facebook B and the American customers remain with Facebook A, then you would have the same problem that you had in the baby bear case. You still would have a regional monopoly and nothing would actually change. So you would have to think about whether that would really make sense on a, uh, on a specific market. And platforms always tend to monopolize. Um, there is network effects and network effects usually leads to the monopolization of platform, platform markets. And if you break up one platform, that effect is still going to be there. And if you break up Amazon, then uh, usually the, one of the Amazons is going to be uh, proved to be the best. And therefore, they are going to have the same effect again, the network effect again. And in 20 years time, you will probably be able to break it up again. So I'm rather critical of that. Um, it makes more sense to um, apply pressure to the market dominators uh, to adjust their, uh, their strategy and their behavior to, uh, to behave in a market uh, conforming way. These platforms, and in particular commercially organized um, markets, are also very interesting. Because sometimes you see that uh, the market platform then excludes certain participants because they don't like them. And um, the question is, because, I mean, they, they violated some of our regulations. Yeah. So 
but sometimes it's it, it's very hard to follow whether this was actually the case. So let's say um, actually a friend of mine uh, started a, a Facebook account in the pandemic and he used the same uh, the same image as on Twitter. And on Twitter, he has been active for, for a couple of years already. So Facebook detected that there's a Twitter account with the same profile picture. Mm -hmm. And then they said, okay, this is identity theft. And they blocked the account. And then he said, this is, this is not okay. And said, I'm, I'm a real person. And then like 10 minutes later, he got, uh, so, so he tried to object. And 10 minutes later, he was told, look, we had a look at your case and you are blocked for perpetuity. So you're blocked uh -huh. forever. Yeah. <laughs> so. <laughs> yeah, that's a problem, but there's rather a problem of the, of the functioning of the, um, um, of, of the mechanisms of, of Facebook. Under competition law, it's quite clear uh, that you have um, a, a right of access. Um, if you need that right uh, of, uh, if you need the access to, to that uh, platform, um, for commercial reasons, at least. Otherwise, one could uh, argue whether the competition would apply at all. Uh, but usually, uh, what we're what we're, what we're saying is that a market dominator like Facebook is under an obligation uh, to, um, to to allow the to the use of their service um, um, on a non-discriminatory basis, so to say. So this is a question of discrimination, and this would if there is no good cause for the exclusion of a specific person, um, then um, uh, in the economic context, at least, it would um, be a violation of Article One and Two or uh, of the provisions in uh, German law. Um, the problem is that you usually don't sue Facebook to regain access. You don't bring suits to the to the uh, to the courts where uh, I don't even know where Facebook is situated in Germany, mm -hmm. where you can even uh, where you can even uh, sue them. So um, that is more a question um, of uh, the, the 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 functioning of, uh, of of Facebook and the organization of Facebook. You will have a means to sue them, and you're probably going to win that case if you take the uh, the resources in your hand to get your Facebook account back. And well. <laughs> Who wants a Facebook account? I don't. So. Yeah, then again, it's just a Facebook account, but I, I have to hire a lawyer. I have to go to court in exactly. order to, to regain access. Um, There's small incentive and a high risk, high cost, because then you would have to show that there is no, uh, no good cost for the termination of your contract. Okay. I assume in such a case, if the lawyer would threaten to sue Facebook in court, they would probably take a real look at the case and say, okay, <laughs> that was obviously a mistake. I am sorry. And here is, uh, and I'm going to give you access and whatever, maybe a, a voucher for 100 euros to spend on the Facebook fan shop or something like that. Okay. Yeah, uh, might be a result. But we see that on many of marketplaces that people get blocked or removed for yeah. very strange reasons. And this is also something that's a, a little bit worrisome if you have this monopoly. Like, yeah. But as I said, we have a right of access. So you need to, to, if you're discriminated against by a market dominator, he has to show that there was a good cause for that. For example, you didn't pay your bills. If you don't pay your bills with Amazon, um, or if you are starting to sell illegal products on Amazon, like drugs or something like that, then they are, of course, is within their rights to terminate your, your account. But if there is no good cause for that, they are in principle under an obligation uh, as a market dominator, as long as they are a market dominator, to um, accept you as a customer. Mm -hmm. as a customer. Yeah, so Amazon, I think, also has a lot of problems with fraud on their platform. And this is also why they get more and more restri restrictive in letting people access the platform at all. And you have to have, by now, already pretty large barriers in order to access the market at all. Um, 
but which is which is good. I mean, um, if they wouldn't do that and you get uh, defrauded by some by one of the marketplace sales, you would say, why didn't Amazon do anything about that? Exactly. Why don't they exactly. take they take up the, the losses from that? So um, there's always two sides on on, on the metal and mistakes happen that's the, the whole the whole problem in that case that you have just outlined that was probably somebody who didn't really want to do his work that seems like a really strange case but if you if, if it's really only about making sure that the seller is really um, an, an actual seller and there is no risk for my customers then um, i think um, it's a good function that they have and it's good that they do that Yeah, so that's sometimes also yeah, difficult to see the whole picture because sometimes you only look at a certain mm -hmm. situation or market from your personal user or seller perspective, but you you don't see all sides, right? So also that the market has to be safe and uh, yeah. fully free of fraud and, and things like that. Um, it's also a big thing. What do you think about the, the individualized uh, prices? So there's these... Um, Uh, people that are thinking about automated software that try to figure out where you're located and then offer, let's say you live in Erlangen, then I charge a higher price than if you live uh, whatever on, on the countryside for this and this product because there's a higher demand in the city or maybe there's a higher demand for snow shovels, uh, shovels uh, somewhere in, in the mountain range and you say, oh, this, this people, they're, they're living in the mountains so I charge more money for, for selling uh, the shovels there. Um, there has been some discussion on that uh, in um, different areas of the law, actually. Um, a friend of mine wrote an article on that, uh, Professor Hofmann, you might uh, also know him, Franz Hofmann from the Institute of Recht and Technik. Um, uh, he wrote an article on that, and I've, if I remember the article correctly, uh, he said that it's a violation of uh, the uh, it's an unfair trading practice um, in specific circumstances. From a um, competition law point of view, it's not so problematic um, unless you are a market dominator. So if a market dominator does that, a market dominator for shovels or something like that um, is um, um, discriminating here, then we are in, the, in principle um, in a situation where uh, he must not discriminate against his customers. Um, that is um, something um, that it would be hard to enforce because the um, market dominator could probably show, possibly show that there are, um, that there's a reason, uh, there's a good cause for the price differentiation based on cost differentiation. If you can show that it, uh, it's more costly to deliver his shovels to the mountainside compared to Erlangen, then he has a right to forward the price difference also to the customers. So we have those cases are usually not decided in, on the in connection with retailers and uh, sales to individual customers, but usually with sales by manufacturers to, um, to large chains of stores and individual stores. So there's a difference is usually about the uh, volume rebates and stuff like that. So if you have volume rebates, you really have, if you're applying volume rebates as a, um, as a market dominator, you have to make sure uh, that, the, that, the, that the rebate only covers the, uh, the saved costs based on the delivery of 100,000 items compared to 10 items. And, and mass production. So there is a possibility to, to challenge that. Um, if you are looking at the differentiation between member states within the European Union, um, it is uh, very easy, it's prohibited. <laughs> uh, so uh, we have a specific uh, regulation of that, the so-called geo-blocking regulation on the European level. This applies within the whole European Union. Um, and it's not only dealing with geo-blocking, but it's also dealing with price discrimination based on the identification of the location of the customer. 
So you must not apply different prices based on the nationality of, of the location of your customer. And that is, by the way, interesting. Um, it's not only the, uh, true if you identify the location based on the um, on the uh, on the IP address or something like that on the internet. That is what the regulation is directed at. But the wording is so wide and even uh, prohibits um, uh, the uh, asking higher prices from tourists compared to uh, to, to Germans if they are. Uh, just getting into your store. So if you are if you have a store and you're saying, okay, I'm going to ask double the price because I see they are French, they speak French, they are probably French, so I'm charging a higher price because they're the, they don't know how much the Lebkuchen in Nuremberg usually costs. Uh, then you are in violation of the geo-blocking regulation, which is probably a surprise to most of to most people. That, well, typically you advertise also your prices in public such that they yeah. could essentially check. But this is, isn't, wouldn't that also be this uh, kind of hub mechanism? So if I were to start a service that somehow decodes where a person is, is living and then ad, um, essentially recommend prices to my customers and say, okay, this is a wealthy area, charge more. And this wouldn't that be exactly this hub role that you hub and spokes um, that you are showing there? Wouldn't so it's a right? service provider who is influencing the prices of different sellers on the same of competitors on the same market in the same way. Yes, that would yeah. be a hub, uh, hub situation where I would say there would be a violation uh, of uh, competition law because the contact then takes place via the hub and that would also violate, uh, would also be a violation by the spokes. Yeah. So, so there's a, there are a lot of problems with the individualized prices and in particular also regarding... Uh, if you do it individually and not using uh, such a platform and if you are uh, not a market dominator on the market, And you are not discriminating based on nationality or location uh, within within Europe, then um, it's uh, probably unproblematic, uh, save for the theory that it's uh, um, a uh, unfair uh, unfair um, unfair trading practice. Uh, mm -hmm. I really cannot uh, comment too much on that. It's not my field of expertise in unfair, uh, unfair okay. trading practices. Okay. But you also seem that there might be one or two problems of such practices yeah. that have to be considered really with care before you start yeah. offering such a service. Absolutely right. There's some discussion on that, so if I already said, but there, since this is not very commonly used, there, is, there are no um, court decisions yet uh, mm -hmm. dealing with that, especially not by the high court. And, and until we have something like that, there is not going to be any security, any legal security on the question. That's yeah, it, always what, what, is, uh, what is happening. If new questions arise, then there is a lot of discussion, but there is no result. The result um, is only, only takes place if somebody actually does it and then um, is taken to court. Uh, <laughs> for that. I'm pretty sure that also people like the Chaos Computer, Computer Club, and they also have their eyes on such practices. Yeah, and probably. if <laughs> such strategies are implemented at large, I'm pretty sure that they will discover and spark at least a discussion about this topic. <laughs> yeah, it's possible. Yeah. Um, there's, there's one very interesting example by, by Elon Musk, uh, where he started announcing rebuying stock of Tesla, I believe, on Twitter at some point for a certain mm -hmm. price. Uh, is, is that a, a concerted practice? <laughs> can can uh, Elon Musk do that? <laughs> no, that is, he must not do that. But uh, that's a different, um, a different mechanism. This is a, not a, a, a competition law but capital markets law. And capital markets law is much more precise um, when it comes to, uh, to, to market behavior and it contains, uh, has a provision both in America as in, uh, and in European law against market manipulation. Uh, so 
you could argue that the such an advanced uh, information um, on future market behavior on capital markets would amount to a market manipulation. But since this was a unilateral conduct done only by one person, not communicating with anybody, but just an open information to the public, um, it would not um, be the basis of a concerted practice of the risk. Okay. Um, that is pretty clear. Um, it could, but as I said, under capital markets law, you could argue that it was prohibited. And I think he was even uh, fined in some way by the Securities and Exchange Commission in the United States. Exactly. Yeah, but they he also thought that was a market manipulation. I think he also announced that the Tesla autopilot uh, feature would increase in price on this and the state and so on. So I think he, he does stuff like that uh, on a regular Yeah, yeah, uh, yes. Um, <laughs> it's even worse. I think he even um, um, published on Twitter that, the, that some features would uh, be available starting on a specific day and it was not true. So and since then was uh, information was relevant for the stock price, the stock price rose because okay, now they are far enough to, I think it was really the feature that would allow the car to really run by itself completely. Um, and that was not, not even true. So the stock price uh, thought it was a major development and the stock price rose and it wasn't true. And therefore afterwards the stock price would go down. So that was a clear example um, of misinformation, which is one one of the uh, um, one of the cases of market manipulation under capital markets law. Actually, he has been quite consistent about that because whenever you ask him when automated driving will be available on Tesla, he says six months from now. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> If you go back to all the interviews, he keeps claiming in six months, every car will drive an autonomous with Tesla and a not self-driving car will be as useful as a horse. Okay. <laughs> then, uh, then you could also argue it's only a practical joke and therefore it's not market manipulation because everybody <laughs> would have to, uh, have to see that it doesn't make any sense. So if you are just... Uh, uh, publishing non obvious nonsense is uh, uh, legal. It's, <laughs> it's legal. It's, it's, it's not market manipulation. See and have, uh, um, we'll, uh, we'll we'll see that it's actually nonsense. Actually, there, there was an, an interview with Lex Friedman, and then later there was even an additional quote by Lex Friedman, where he actually added that the information in this interview is, is not entirely shared by him, and uh, that the, the, he questions the validity of, of some of the claims and so on, because he keeps saying these yeah. things. <laughs> yeah, you always have to make sure that, that the consequences will not fall on you if somebody else <laughs> Always a good strategy. You know? Yeah, so, so he was probably afraid that because he posted the video uh, that it falls into his yeah. responsibility. Yeah. yeah. That he, he actually makes these claims. Yeah. Very interesting. I think we could go on for hours with this discussion, but uh, at some point, of course, uh, we, we also have to stop. I would like to thank you very much for this insight into competition law and also for answering my very basic understanding of competition law and the associated questions. So thank you very much for coming here. <laughs> well, thank you very much for having me and for, for the invitation. And um, I'm very much looking forward to cooperation in the future. And some applause for you. I hope you can hear it. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, you've seen that we had a vivid discussion on the different interpretations of competition law and what kind of behavior could be a potential risk of free markets and their competition. So I think this was a very interesting discussion and I finally got the opportunity to ask all the questions that I had about competition law and probably 
uh, market endangering activity that is actually not supposed to be done and forbidden by law. So I found that a really good opportunity. I hope you enjoyed the presentation and maybe also the discussion as much as I did. And if you like this video, give us a thumbs up. Otherwise, I would also like to ask you to stay tuned. We will have more presentations here coming up in Beyond the Patterns. So I'd also recommend to subscribe to our channel. Thank you very much for watching and bye bye.